Okay, we are going to talk about a new mechanism of action, which is the um, protein synthesis inhibition. So as I said in the introduction, um, the machinery, protein synthesis machinery, including the ribosomes, is kind of different in bacteria um, when you com compare to um, animal cells. And because of this difference, we can use this as a target for um, drugs, antibacterials or antimicrobials. <clears throat> so I want to start by talking about the aminoglycosides. So in this video, we're going to talk about the protein synthesis inhibitors, aminoglycosides, tetracyclines, and I think I'll probably get to the macrolides as well. So aminoglycosides are the first ones, and they're kind of interesting because Unlike the other um, protein synthesis inhibitors, these drugs are considered bactericidal. The other ones are considered bacteriostatic. So you can see on the picture there that the target of these protein synthesis inhibitors is the 30S subunit of the ribosome. So the aminoglycosides, some that you might f be familiar with are streptomycin, gentamicin, neomycin. Um, these agents bind directly and irreversible to that 30S ribosomal subunit. Remember, you don't need to remember which of these different ribosomal subunits. Um, that's not really important for our class. Um, the thing about the aminoglycosides is they are really only used for serious infections because um, they have a lot of toxicity. So they're reserved for serious infections due mostly to aerobic gram-negative um, microbes, bacilli specifically, although they are effective against some gram-positives, but not against, um, not against anaerobes. So these bacteria use an oxy oxygen-dependent um, transport system to bring the aminoglycosides into the cell. So the anaerobes don't have that system, therefore these drugs wouldn't be useful for those critters. But the, the aerobic ones, they can, they can be pretty effective against. Um, in the previous video, I talked about penicillins being, and I think I actually said it with the cephalosporins, but it's um, common with penicillins and cephalosporins to be administered along with an aminoglycoside. And again, the reason for that is the penicillins or the cephalosporins they, they break the continuity of the cell wall, and then that will allow the aminoglycosides entry into the cell because they have to get into the cell in order for them to be effective. They have to get to the ribosome, that 30S subunit. Um, these drugs are pretty toxic, as I said. Um, they are poorly absorbed through the GI tract, so they are given parenterally, with the exception of neomycin, which is given topically. Um, the margin of safety is small with these. Remember, that means that the dose that harms and the dose that helps isn't very far away from one another. Um, the big toxic effects of the aminoglycosides are they're toxic to the ear, to the kidney, and also to the neuromuscular junction. So in re reference to the ear, they can be um, toxic against both the cochlea and the vestibule. So there's that prov promotes um, quite a few s side effects one of which is ringing in the ears or tinnitus, deafness, also vertigo um, because of the vestibular uh, issue, and high-frequency hearing loss. It seems like the effects at the cochlea, the toxic effects of the cochlea, are due to selective destruction of the outer hair cells in the organ of corti. If you remember that part of the ear, that part of the ear is crazy. But those hair cells are really important in the in the ability to um, propagate an impulse to the to the temporal lobe of the brain where we make sense out of all that information, sensory information. Um, so that's what's going on with the ear. They're toxic to the kidneys because they are taken up. The drug is taken up very quickly by the proximal tubule cells, and they're toxic to the drug is toxic to the pro proximal tubular cells, so it can kill those. Um, cells. So it can cause acute, it can cause nephrotoxicity, both acute and chronic. The acute one, if you get rid of the drug, take the, stop taking the drug, is usually reversible. Um, and then we also can see some neurotoxicity. Um, the drug can cause, can block the presynaptic release of acetylcholine. 
and also it seems to have a little bit of a postsynaptic blockade as well. So this can cause neuromuscular weakness, as you can imagine, and also respiratory depression. So as I said, these drugs have been replaced by safer drugs. Um, one thing that's kind of good is that they are uh, resistance is pretty uncommon with these agents, but they're pretty toxic. So I don't know that that's not that great of a trade off. Um, and I think I said it already, but they are generally given parenterally or IV with the exception of neomycin, which is given topically. Neomycin is way too top to toxic to the kidneys to give it any other way. All right, now we are going to talk about tetracyclines. The tetracyclines, I talked briefly about tetracycline, I believe, when we did our skin conversation when we were talking about, uh, um, when we were talking about acne. So tetracyclines are also protein synthesis inhibitors, and you see they bind this, these ones reversibly, where the aminoglycosides was an irreversible binding. They bind reversibly to the 30S subunit of the bacterial ribosome and therefore inhibit protein synthesis. So this is our broadest spectrum of any antibiotic class, which means it's going to be effective against all kinds of organisms, many gram positives, many gram negatives, some anaerobes. Um, <clears throat> Tetracycline um, is going to have some pretty uh, specific uses. It's used drug of choice for a lot of our animal-borne infections, including Lyme disease and Rocky Mountain spotted fever. It also is effective against chlamydia, is the main sexual transmitted infection, STI, you see there, um, and also against um, mycoplasma pneumonia. It's also effective against cholera to some degree. So um, I guess we can think about it being specifically kind of um, some of the oddball infections um, that are, are promoted by the spirochetes and some of the rickettsia. Another thing to know about tetracyclines is that food impairs the absorption. So you want to take this away from food. Um, with the exception of doxycycline and minocycline, it doesn't seem to be as big of a deal with those drugs. Um, tetracycline also forms insoluble chelates with calcium, magnesium, and other metals, and so therefore we recommend that people don't take antacids, which tend to have a fair amount of calcium and magnesium in them, when they're taking tetracyclines. Um, so there's quite a, this is a broad spectrum antibiotic. So we have a lot of super infections when we administer these broad spectrum drugs. They the drugs target the GI tract, so there tends to be a lot of GI side effects. They can be toxic to the liver, and then there's some kind of strange um, the strange relationship with with children, and it seems that tetracyclines are readily incorporated into the teeth and into the bone. And they can cause the teeth to be discolored, pardon me. And usually the discoloration is kind of a gray color, especially when given to kids before um, their teeth have fully formed. And they can also retard bone growth because they get incorporated into the bone as well. So for those reasons, they're not recommended for children or pregnant women. Um, and also there's, a, which is not on this slide, but there is an increased incidence of um, really sensitive, uh, highly sensitive to the sun. So they can get a lot of sunburn when they're taking tetracyclines. So that is something else to think about. And the final thing that I know I talked about when we talked about um, tetracycline in context with the acne is that oftentimes um, people with acne, women, children, girls, <laughs> young women, sorry, uh, they're administered oral contraceptives in addition to tetracycline for their skin. And the one thing about oral contraceptives and in combination with tetracycline is tetracycline decreases the efficacy of the oral contraceptive. So that's a very important bit of information for people to have if they're taking tetracycline and oral contraceptives to know that their oral contraceptives are not going to be as effective. Okay, I want to also in this video talk a little bit about the quinolones, um, the fluoroquinolones and the quinolones. These are drugs that inhibit um, DNA gyrase or another enzyme co called toposomerase. Um, these enzymes are bacterial and they're essential for the duplication, transcription, and repair of bacterial DNA. 
Okay, so for that reason, these drugs are considered um, to be, their mechanism is to get in, the, get in the way of DNA replication. So DNA replication inhibitors, if you will. So here are three quinolones, uh, ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, moxifloxacin. These are th the third generation, same kind of idea. Um, the quinolones are relatively new antimicrobials, and they were originally designed to treat patients with urinary tract infections. So that's kind of what we think about when we think about the quinolones. Um, so they are broad spectrum. They are anti uh, pardon me, they're bactericidal. They are rarely first-line agents, but they are used to treat genitourinary, respiratory, GI, some skin infections, and some soft tissue infections. And so you can see there we've got respiratory tract infections, especially the resistant ones, um, joints, bones, skin, and soft structures. Um, those common side effects of these drugs are nausea, headache, photophobia, which is a sensitivity to the sun, um, and dizziness is quite common with the quinolones and the fluoroquinolones. Those are the common side effects. But then there's some more serious side effects that are also not terribly uncommon. And um, these are psychosis, agitation, tremors, toxicity to the liver, toxicity to the interstitial tissue of the kidneys. That's what interstitial nephritis is. Tendinitis is the one that I'm going to spend, come back to in a minute. Joint rupture and prolonged QT interval affecting the heart. Um, the tendonitis and the joint rupture is something that's getting quite a lot of press currently. Um, right now, there is there really a lot of discussion around not prescribing these medications because of these more serious side effects. And migrating tendonitis and joint rupture is one that we ha we really saw in animals early on, but they're starting to see more and more in this of these um, long-term side effects in people. And it seems like they can develop some of these side effects with just one application of the drug and the side effects of tendonitis and the joint issues persist for many years after. So for that reason, they're really um, s s cautioning against these drugs in general practice. Uh, and the other thing that kind of complicates this is these drugs were used quite a bit, Cipro is used specifically quite a bit for urinary tract infections. And now we're starting to see some resistance with E. coli, which is the main organism that cause urina causes urinary tract infections. So that's another thing that's making these drugs less desirable and these, and these potentially very serious side effects. Okay, in the final video, I'm going to come back and I'm going to talk about macrolides, chloramphenicol, and lincosamides, and that will be the last one. So I'll see you in a little bit.